الحمد لله الصلاة والسلام على رسول الله common sense and reason leads us and must inevitably lead us to believe that this universe has a creator that there is one creator who is wise powerful and self-sufficient that is different from the universe and the creation in which we live and then we came to understand that when we looked at the world religions all of them in one manner or another compromise this basic commonsensical reasonable belief except Islam Islam is the religion that teaches us this beautiful pure monotheism that makes so much sense that is so reasonable and that is so close to the natural instinctive understanding of the human being but someone may have after this a question well that's fine that's a very nice belief it makes a lot of sense but anybody could come up with such a belief in fact maybe a person could argue that there are philosophers in the past who came up with a concept of God very very close to that does that mean that what they said and what they did and what they followed was revelation and guidance from God no of course not because when it comes to the issue of revelation and guidance from God we have to ask some more questions of course the first one is do we need revelation and guidance from God well I think again when we apply our common sense when we apply our reasoning faculties then we will say yes in fact the human being is desperately in need of the wisdom and the guidance from the supreme being from the wise creator of the heavens and the earth in fact we find that God has provided for us Allah has provided for us the creator has provided for us in every single aspect of our life we feel thirst and we have been provided with the means to satisfy our thirst we feel hunger and we've been given the means to satisfy our hunger we feel love and the need for companionship and the means to satisfy that love has been given to us so we find in all our material needs even in our emotional needs the provision and the means to satisfy those needs is there but the human being has another need a need that is perhaps even greater than the physical and emotional needs and we have the need to know what is the purpose of our life why are we here what is the reason for our existence and not only that to know the purpose but once we know the purpose to know how do we fulfill that purpose so there is something very precious and that's to know the meaning of life and there's something more precious that once you know the meaning of life you know how to live that life so the human being has a great need for that and it would not be irrational or illogical to expect that when we look and we see the condition of the human being that the one who has created this universe and provided for us in all aspects must have also provided for us in this most needy of all aspects this desperate need for us to know what is the purpose of our life what is the reason for our existence and how to fulfill that created purpose also we would say that any human being who looks at this universe and observes the bounty that its creator has provided us with would also wish to express their gratitude and their love and their appreciation for such a beneficent and merciful and bountiful creator but then the question is there how do we do that how do we express our gratitude in a way that is pleasing to God what are the things that this creator wants us, wants us to do what is the manner in which this creator wishes us to express our gratitude this is a very another important question some people feel content that well I'll just do anything I feel like or I can just guess but no rational person and no thinking person would really be satisfied with that because again when we go back to our premise and we think about ourselves and our everyday life and our common human experience 
common human experience tells us that that is not a satisfactory manner or a satisfactory way in dealing with things at all. If you want to give your friend a present to show your appreciation, you won't just give your friend anything that you feel like and that makes you happy. You're going to make an effort to find out what your friend wants, what your friend likes. What sort of gift would they like to receive? Not what you want to give. This is just common sense. So even more then, when we want to thank the creator of the universe and express our awe and reverence and gratitude to God, we can't just do whatever we feel like, whatever happens to come to our mind, or whatever traditional culture we just happen to follow. No. Rather, we need some guidance from God. The conclusion of all of that is, common sense tells us that we are in desperate need of some type of concrete guidance from our Creator. Some revelation, some guidance, some means that we could be sure and that we could understand and that we could know that this is the way God wants us to live our lives. This is the purpose for which God created us. This is how we could thank Him and express our gratitude to Him. Lots of people claim, in one way or another, to be bringing that guidance from God. Lots of people are claiming, I'm getting a message from God. I'm getting a revelation from God. God wants you to do this. God doesn't want you to do that. There's so many religions and so many people and so many, uh, so many sects and groups. and All of them are making essentially the same claim, claim that they have some sort of divine guidance, some sort of... Uh, guidance for you in which you're going to live your life uh, in a way that is pleasing to God. But we have to use some sort of method to sort out, to understand. So again, let us use our reasoning process. Let us use our minds to come to this, to some sort of conclusion. It's very interesting, in fact, that the Qur'an, the Qur'an, by the way, is the book of the Muslims. But it's not only the holy book of the Muslims. The Qur'an is what Muslims believe to be the actual words of God. The words of God, the speech of God that was revealed to his God's final messenger Muhammad. May God's peace and blessings be upon him 1,400 years ago. The Qur'an actually gives a type of criterion, a type of means that the human being could use in order to distinguish something that is revelation and something that is from God against something that is a human invention. So the Qur'an gives forward a simple suggestion or a simple statement. If this book, the Qur'an, was from anyone else other than God, you would find within it many discrepancies, many contradictions. That's quite a simple, quite a rational and quite a sensible proposition. If God is all-knowing, and if God is all-wise, and God is all-seeing, and God is all-hearing, certainly from our previous thinking and previous process, and looking at this universe and looking at this creation, we can definitely understand that the one who created this universe is very wise and very powerful. This creator is able to string together the molecules and atoms to form the chain of the DNA. The DNA that is the blueprint that makes creatures what they are. Could we imagine that such a creator who is able to bring into existence such a complicated system is not able to reveal a revelation that is consistent with itself without contradictions? No, surely such a wise and powerful being is more than able to reveal to human beings a book, a revelation that is free from contradictions, that is free from discrepancies. So this is a type of challenge that the Qur'an lays down, that we could apply not only to the Qur'an itself, but to any scripture or any book or any person who comes along claiming revelation and claiming guidance from God. How could a book 1,400 years old have information that was not known at that time at all by anybody and that has only been discovered recently. This is the sort of thing we would expect from a revelation that is from God. We would not expect a revelation from God to tell us that the earth is resting on an elephant which is standing on a tortoise which is swimming in the sea. 
This is the type of statement we would not expect to find in a book that's from God. This is a type of fairy tale, a type of fantasy story, a type of bedtime invention that some mother invented to tell their children. It's not something we could accept to be a revelation from God. For example, to take another example, the Bible. The Bible is a book that the Muslims believe contains some things that are from God. But we also believe that this is a book that has become corrupted and distorted throughout time. Firstly, the Bible does not exist in the original language of the people to whom it was revealed. This is the first stage of corruption. Secondly, things have been taken out and other things have been put in. So one of the very interesting things about the Bible is that when you read the very beginning of the Bible, it starts by telling us that God created the light and he called it day and he created the darkness and he called it night and the first day came and the first night came. Yet the Bible tells us that God did not create the sun until the fourth day. That begs a question to the rational inquiring mind. How did you get night and day without a sun? Now someone could say, well, God can do anything. That's not the point. We agree, God can do anything. But that's not the issue. The issue is this. Does this scripture reflect reality? The one who wrote this, does this seem to be like the one who wrote this knew the processes that exist in this universe? That the night and day is caused by the alternation and the rotation of the earth on its axis? No. The one who wrote the Bible clearly did not know that this was the process through which the night and day occurred. They obviously imagined that there was some entity of light and some entity of darkness and that light and darkness were caused by the existence of these entities. In fact, this was exactly the ancient Babylonian myth. So what we find is the Bible actually, rather than reflecting scientific fact, actually reflects ancient Babylonian mythology. And it would seem that the Bible, or not that there was an original Bible, that the true revelation of God was corrupted and changed in order to make it conform with these mythologies and these ideas that existed at the time. So we therefore cannot say that such a book is from God. Rather, because on the basis of what? On the, on the rational basis. That this does not, this actually contradicts reality. These statements contradict reality. And that it is a discrepancy. And we would not imagine that a book that is from God to contain such contradictions and to contain such discrepancies. But when we examine the Qur'an, when we look at the Qur'an, we find not only is the Qur'an consistent with itself and consistent with external realities, in fact the Qur'an is making statements that, as I mentioned before, scientists have only began to discover recently, statements about astronomy statements about geology, statements about biology, statements on oceanography. In fact, so many fields of scientific discovery, the Qur'an is mentioning things that are amazing, some of the top world scientists. How could this information be in a book 1,400 years old? And some of them have concluded quite rationally, quite sensibly, that it must be a revelation from the Creator of the heavens and the earth. So this is one manner in which we could decide and we could see whether a book is revelation or not. So first of all, the Quran calls us to this beautiful, pure, monotheistic belief, this rational belief that there is one God who has created everything and that God is different and distinct from the creation. Secondly, the Quran is consistent with itself. Now there is one more thing I want to look at. And the other aspect I want to look at is the messenger, the person to whom the revelation was given. Now there are many different ways we could imagine. There are many different ways we could imagine that God might let us know about himself, how to thank him, how to worship him, uh, how we should live our lives. There are many different ways. For example, just, this is just thinking and guessing and thinking, well, 
how could we, maybe, for example, God might leave a book just lying around somewhere or inscribed in a rock or something like that. So this is one idea, that there is a book just lying around, waiting there to be discovered, that contains the information uh, that we need. This is one possibility. The second possibility is that uh, God would let every single individual human being know. Every human being and every individual human being would be inspired with that knowledge and with that message and with that revelation from God. This is another possibility. Or the other possibility is that God would send a messenger. God would give this knowledge and this revelation to a specific and special human being. Now Islam teaches that this is the way, the last way, that this is the manner in which God has chosen to let us know, human beings, let us know about himself, about how we should be grateful to him, about how we should worship him and thank him, uh, and how we should live our lives in a way that is pleasing to him. This is the manner, through prophets. So Islam accepts and believes in the concept of prophethood, that there are special chosen human beings. And again, when we think about it, when we look at the nature of the human being, and when we look at this option as compared to other options, we find without doubt that this is the most rational, this is the most sensible, uh, and this is the best means of conveying that message to the human beings because there are really more weaknesses and more deficiencies in the other methods. For example, one of the deficiencies in the idea that God could have left some book lying around or God could have inscribed this message somewhere uh, and, and we just discover it and we have to go and discover it. One of the deficiencies in it is there is no practical example of another human being living and acting out that revelation. This is a problem because human beings might say, well, that's all well and good, and here are all these rules, and here are all these things that we have to follow, and this is how we should live our life. But where's a practical example? Where can I see someone doing that? This is something that human beings, from our common experience, we really need that. We have a great need of a practical example for us, either to see directly in front of us, or that we could read about historically, but we need some physical, practical example to see a human being doing those things. That's why the idea of some divine being, some god, uh, some demigod, uh, some angel, some supernatural being coming down, it's very deficient because the, it, always leaves the, the, it always leaves the argument open but hey, that, that's not a person, that's an angel. That's not a, a human being, that's a God. How can we be like a God? How can we be like an angel? It's a perfectly fair argument. But if God sends a messenger who is a human being, who eats food like we eat food, who marries like we marry, who has the same desires that we have, the same needs that we have, has the same weaknesses that the human being has, Yet this person is able to overcome those weaknesses and manifest those excellent qualities and display them for us in a manner that is practical and real. Then we can say, yes, there is a living example of another human being who can live their life in accordance to the will of God. And we can imitate that and we can emulate that. That is why God chose to reveal his message to human beings, although albeit very special human beings and those very special human beings were the prophets the messengers Islam teaches us that there were many messengers sent to many nations to many people some of those messengers uh, you may be familiar with Abraham Moses Jacob uh, Jesus they are all mentioned in the Quran as messengers of God they were all prophets of God they were not gods or sons of God they were human beings who are given revelation from God. We believe that the last of all of those messengers was Muhammad. May Allah's peace, may God's peace and blessings be upon him. And that he is the guide for all of humanity. And he is the final messenger. Uh, and he is the messenger for our time. And 
that is another means through which we could understand that Islam is the truth. When we look at the life of Prophet Muhammad, when we look at the life and the teaching and the action and the actions of this man, really a person must be convinced that this man is really truly what he claimed to be a messenger of God. Because his example, the way that he lived his life, the manner in which he behaved, really manifest those qualities of goodness, of honesty, of truthfulness, of trustworthiness, of sincerity, of compassion, yet at the same time of firmness and uncompromising dedication to the message that God desires him to deliver. If we look at the life of Prophet Muhammad, we find all of those qualities are manifest in this man. In fact, really to study the life of Prophet Muhammad is to study one of those convincing proofs and those rational means through which and by which the human being can come to know that indeed Islam is the revelation from the creator of it, the heavens and the earth for the guidance and for the benefit of all of the human beings so that we could live in true peace with ourselves, with our families, with our society and with the world at large. Just as all of the creatures in this universe, indeed even the inanimate objects, the sun, the moon, the stars, are all obeying the laws of God. If we wish to be in harmony, in symbiosis with this universe, then we also need to choose as human beings to submit to and obey the laws of God. But we human beings have a choice. In some regards, not in the manner of breathing and eating, we are like the creatures. We have to obey the laws of God. But there are other things, emotionally, intellectually, in our actions of worship, that we can choose to obey God or to disobey God. And if we wish to be in a true state of peace and harmony with the creation, then we must also do what all of the creation is doing and submit ourselves entirely and completely to the laws and the commands and the will of our Creator and live our lives in a manner that is displaying gratitude and thankfulness to our bountiful Lord who is Allah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. May God's peace and blessings be upon all of you.